Hello, everyone. I'm Stephanie Boozer with CGC HQ, and I'm so happy to welcome you to today's webinar. Going to be talking about Citrix DAS. I guess I can say, do you pronounce it DAS or do you say D A A S? DAS. Yeah. DAS. I didn't even have it. <laughs> See, I'm not your presenter. So <laughs> I'm just your host. Um, so anyway, welcome and glad you're here. Um, I do have a link for you in the chat. It's to our CGC events calendar. So you can see everything that we have coming up. And also on the slide, you can see that we've got our local meetings still happening and two big XL events coming up. Um, Southeast XL is next week and you don't have to live in the Southeast to go because it's virtual. So please check it out. Um, also our first ever EMEA XL event is happening in October. That's all of our uh, EMEA groups kind of banded together and are hosting this giant virtual event. So check out both of those and um, get registered. All right, so as I said, we're gonna be talking about Citrix DAS <laughs> for business continuity. Um, but before I hand things over, I wanted to go over a couple of housekeeping details. Um, just as always, we are recording today's session and you'll get a link to the recording tomorrow. It's going to come to you from GoToWebinar, so watch out for that. Um, also, please type in your questions. We would love to answer all your questions today, so type them in as you have them, and I think we're going to save most of them for the end, but um, do type them in as you have them, and we'll get to as many as we can. And then finally, um, at the end, I'll have a quick uh, survey for you. It's short and anonymous and for CUGC use only. We just like to get your feedback. All right, so... I'm happy to welcome Anna Ruiz to our webinar stage today. She is a technical marketing architect at Citrix, and she also is a host of the Clickdown podcast, and she's involved with TechZone Live. I'm going to throw um, links to both of those in the chat for you in just a bit. Um, so hello, Anna. Hey, guys. <laughs> And also we have Bart Jacobs with us today. Bart is a CTP and he's based in Belgium and he's gonna keep an eye on all of the questions that you have and, and help facilitate that discussion for us today. So thanks for being here, Bart, in your CGC okay. shirt. <laughs> All right, Anna, I'm gonna hand things over to you. I'm gonna send the screen to you right now. Perfect. And oops, there, okay, there you go. All righty, so let me go ahead and show my screen and start my slide deck. Are we good? Do you see it, Stephanie? Yes, I see it. Perfect. All righty, well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, um, and welcome to the session. I am very happy to be here today. Thank you to CUGC for inviting me. Um, to talk about this great topic, which is DAS for, for business continuity. Um, so before we get started, I want to tell you a little bit about me and who I am in case you don't know me or have never heard of me. Uh, so like Stephanie said, I am a technical marketing architect here at Citrix, and I've actually been at Citrix seven years ago, which to me, it's insane because it feels like I joined yesterday almost. Um, so it's crazy. My seven year anniversary just passed last month, two months ago. Um, so I'm super excited to be here. I joined as a part of the leadership development program right out of school and I've had, you know, multiple different roles within Citrix. So I was a sales engineer. Um, I was a mobility specialist back in the day when we still called it Send Mobile. So it's been a while. Um, and then I became a sales engineer for enterprise accounts for South Central. So I'm not sure if some of my previous customers are out there, but if they are, how are you guys? Um, after that, two and a half years ago, that's when I switched over to the technical marketing team. Um, and if you know Dan Feller, he's probably a lot more popular than I am. I am part of his organization. Um, so you may be wondering, right, what do I do as a technical marketing architect? And there's a bunch of things that as a team we do. So one of the things is that we run TechZone. So if you're not familiar with TechZone, it's a great place where we write technical uh, papers, technical briefs. We have technical videos, reference architectures, um, POC guides, amongst other things. So that's one of the, the big things that our team does. Um, we also do events like these. Um, so 
the other thing that I do is, like Stephanie mentioned, I am the co-host of the Clickdown. So the Clickdown is our official technical podcast. We launched it earlier this year, and we've had some really good episodes. Uh, they're all technical in nature, where we interview product managers, consultants, sales engineers, um, just a summary of different products and functionality. So be sure to subscribe. We're on all the major podcast platforms. Um, and I'll be plugging the click down, so bear with me throughout the presentation. I'll be talking about some of the different episodes that we've done on the topics that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I also host and run TechZone Live, which is our quarterly event. Um, that's also an event that is new this year. Uh, basically, we merged two very popular webinars. So we merged uh, the Workspace Masterclass, which was run by the technical marketing team, with TIPS, which was run by our consulting organization, and we merged them together to create one quarterly tech event um, called TechZone Live. So um, these are all on demand for the previous three quarters, but be sure to be on the lookout for Q4 because it, it's looking to be a, a very cool event. Um, I graduated from the University of Miami, go Canes, if there's fellow Canes out there. And I currently live in Dallas, Texas with my husband and my two tiny coworkers, like I like to call them. I warned them not to step into my office, but I can't make any promises that they won't make their appearance in today's webinar since it is a live webinar. Um, uh, if you don't follow me on Twitter, uh, I actively post on both Twitter and LinkedIn um, a bunch of technical content, not only that I create, but also that the whole technical marketing team creates, as well as events, episodes of the Clickdown. So make sure to follow me there on LinkedIn or Twitter if you want to stay in the loop of um, some of the things that our team is creating. Alrighty, so that was enough about me. I think you know everything you need to know about me. Um, so just from a quick agenda perspective, um, these are some of the topics that we're going to cover in today's discussion. So we're going to, um, I'll give you a little bit of background about why we're, topic, why we're talking about this topic and why it's very relevant um, to the, the, the world that we're living in today, right? Um, then I'm going to go through a conceptual architecture of what an environment, you know, of DAS or business continuity, what that might look like conceptually. Uh, we'll do an overview of DAS or desktop as a service. Uh, we'll jump in and talk a little bit about service continuity as well as some other tools that are available um, just to facilitate you building and managing your environment. Um, then we'll do a brief section on networking. I will give you a heads up. I am not a networking expert. There's a networking expert on my team, so I will do my best, uh, but that's just as, as an FYI. And then last but not least, we'll talk about uh, one of my favorite Citrix products, which is analytics and how it how analytics fits into this whole architecture and how it can help you. Um, and then I'll give you some additional resources for you to check out if you're interested in learning more about anything that I cover today. Uh, and like Stephanie said, uh, we will have a live Q&A, which Bart will be facilitating. So feel free to type your questions in the chat as I'm presenting, um, and then we could, we could answer them. Alrighty. So from a background perspective, why is this topic important, especially in today's world? Um, as you all know, and you probably lived through it, <laughs> COVID-19 had a tremendous impact on the way people worked. Uh, overnight, everyone needed to work remotely. And Gartner actually did a study, which I found very interesting, where they show kind of pre-pandemic how many people work remote versus what's going to happen, what they estimate post-pandemic. Uh, how many people will work remote. And it went from 30%, 10% of those being uh, always remote workers, to now about half of the workforce will be remote in some capacity, which obviously is a humongous change. Um, from my personal experience, I have worked remotely for since I moved out to Dallas, so probably like five and a half, six years ago. Um, but I know a lot of my friends who were, their companies were very anti-work remote. It was a very special situation if they, if they had to work remote. And those same friends, now fast forward post COVID-19, a lot of them are gonna work remotely permanently or at least in some capacity. So it's, it's really crazy to see that shift in organizations um, who are very anti-remote work and how they're now embracing this flexible remote or hybrid work model. Um, I personally want to believe that we were already heading down this path and that COVID-19 simply accelerated that trend. Uh, just, you know, to show employers that remote work is not a bad thing. 
Um, and that actually has a lot of positive things, right? Especially when you're talking about a flexible or hybrid work environment, both from an employee or end user perspective, as well as an employer perspective, right? Um, from an employee perspective, you have that flexibility, you can manage and work around your own schedule, you know, with obviously some constraints. I know I'm not a morning person, so you'll find me a lot of times doing work at nights and sending emails way past uh, work hours, because that's just how I function and how I work remotely um, and how I'm more, I'm more productive. Um, from an employer perspective, right, we've seen a lot of our customers who have said that they like that their talent, pool, their talent pool has now expanded. So instead of being tied to a specific geographical region for hiring, they now have a lot more flexibility and options for some of these full remote um, job positions where they can hire really anywhere in the world. Uh, so it's really cool to see that, that shift in mindset. Um, so when COVID first hit, right, we were all in pure crisis mode, and you know, I'm I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir. You you guys lived through it, but what we saw is that a lot of customers just didn't have the tools or the infrastructure in place to support that fully remote workforce. Um, even customers who had a small remote workforce, they just didn't have the infrastructure and the tools needed to be able to scale up quickly um, to adapt to this work from home environment. Um, and as we went into this extended remote work, we saw that a lot of organizations started looking at what tools they needed to implement in order to support this flexible work model so that the end users would have a great experience, but also from a security side that they weren't putting their, themselves you know, in a place where they were vulnerable for malicious attackers or for their intellectual property to be stolen. Now we're in this kind of third phase which is this new normal stage. And I know this term is probably overused. I, I hear it all the time, but but it really is this new normal. Stephanie, Bart and I were talking right before we started the, the, this webinar. Is it, and it's like, are we ever really gonna go back to a pre-COVID world? Um, and the reality, at least, is that you know everything changed with COVID and that companies realize that they need to have environment set up and their IT set up where it's a flexible, environment where they could scale up and down easily for any given situation. Hopefully none of us want to live through another pandemic, but you know, things like snowstorms, hurricanes, um, whatever it may be um, to scale up and down quickly. Alrighty, so now we're going to take a look at conceptually what this looks like. Um, Keep in mind that this is not a one-size-fits-all architecture diagram, and what I mean by that is there are obviously additional components that you can add or remove based on your specific needs and your specific situations. Um, for the sake of time, right, I wish I could talk about every single possible scenario uh, under the sun and talk about every single Citrix product and how it fits into, you know, this remote flexible work. Uh, but obviously, for the sake of time, I don't want to keep you here for the entire day. You would get very tired of just hearing my voice. Um, so we're only going to talk about certain Citrix products and how they align with this DAS for Business continuity model. Um, and then in the next slide, I will point out very quickly some other um, things that you can add to this architecture to make it more robust and to add additional functionality as well. Um, so let's get right into it. So first you have your users, right? And your users will access their resources utilizing Citrix Workspace. And I think if you've if you've used Citrix Workspace in the past, the beauty of it from an end user perspective is that you have that similar look and feel regardless of what endpoint you're, you're coming in from and you can pick up right where you left off. So you're not tied to a specific device. Um, basically in, on the back end, what's powering access to those resources are the different Citrix cloud services. And these services are hosted and managed by Citrix, right? So if you look at a traditional on-prem environment where you had to manage all the management components, where you had to, you were responsible for upgrading, for patching, um, with Citrix cloud services, Citrix is taking care of that for you. Uh, like I mentioned previously, there's obviously a lot more Citrix cloud services besides the ones that I have on the screen that you can use for additional functionality. So things like Citrix endpoint management to manage endpoints, Citrix content collaboration if you want to do file sharing collaboration, uh, Citrix secure internet access if you want to provide secure access to web and SaaS applications, um, as well as Citrix secure workspace access for things like single sign 
single sign-on, remote access, and content ins inspection. Um, just to name a few. But of course, for the sake of time, we're going to focus on, on these specific products. Um, so with Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktop Service, you may hear me, you may hear me refer to it as CVADS. I'll try not to use acronyms because I'm aware that I hear these acronyms all day, every day, but um, you may hear me say CVATS just as an FYI. Um, so you could still access those on-premises resources and manage those on-premises virtual apps and desktops or VDAs. Um, and the reason why we, we do this is because we understand that a lot, I would say the majority of our customers want to live in this hybrid model, right? Although they're adopting cloud actively and they see the benefits of cloud, they still have situations or reasons for still keeping some of the resources on premises and we wanna be able to support you in that. Um, but what happens when those VDAs got completely overloaded, right? So if there's a snowstorm up north or if there's a hurricane down in Florida, and all of a sudden you go from, let's say 20% of your workforce working remotely to 90% of your workforce working remotely. Does it really make sense for you to have on-premises, you know, all the resources needed from going to 20 to 90% of your workforce working remotely? Probably not. Um, another thing that we see is for seasonal workers, right? Let's say you have interns that only are gonna be <clears throat> in your company for two months. It probably doesn't make sense for you to have a full on-prem infrastructure to support all of those workers. And that's where um, where you could bur where bursting to the cloud comes in, right? So you're able to burst to the cloud and provide those additional resources. And these could be spun up in Citrix Managed Azure. And the cool thing about it is that you can prioritize the on-premises resources first. And then once those become overloaded, that's when you burst to the cloud, uh, which I think is you know, really important to know. And we'll talk more about that and how we can achieve that later in the presentation. Um, a key component of this is Citrix SD-WAN. And essentially what Citrix SD-WAN does is it's gonna facilitate those cloud resources to be able to communicate with um, and have access to your on-premises environment. And this can be things for access to like file servers, maybe app data that will live on-premises and um, that you don't have to replicate to, to the cloud. Um, I will have a couple of demos sprinkled in throughout so that I don't do death by PowerPoint. Um, and the first one will be, will be right now. Um, so we're gonna look at what essentially the end user experience looks like even if you're accessing for on-premises resources or cloud resources, right? And the idea is that we want that experience to be exactly the same so that from an end user perspective, I have no idea and I don't care where that backend resource ultimately lives. Um, so you'll see on the left-hand side, the VDI is hosted on-premises and on the right-hand side, that uh, VDI is hosted in Citrix Managed Azure. And from the end user experience, it's exactly the same. They log on to Workspace, they get access to the same icon, they click on the same icon, and to them, they don't care where that VDA is hosted, they just care that they have a consistent experience throughout. And what this means is essentially, today I could be accessing a VDI that's hosted on-premises, tomorrow I click on that exact same icon, and it actually might be a VDI that's hosted within Citrix Managed Azure, which I think is pretty powerful and cool. Alrighty, so now we're gonna go into a DAS overview. What is DAS? Um, what does it mean? What's desktop as a service? And how does Citrix provide desktop as a service solutions? So if you're familiar um, with Citrix Managed Desktops, we now renamed it um, to Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktop Standard for Azure, which is a mouthful. And essentially what this does is that it provides customers and partners with a very simple, fast, um, way to deliver applications and desktops and essentially have a pay-as-you-go model. So it's a turnkey in design. It's extremely easy to set up and you are essentially able to deploy applications and apps in minutes versus having to spend days or weeks building your environment. Um, it is designed uh, and built to work on Mac Microsoft Azure and you have the option of either bringing in your own Azure subscription or leveraging Citrix's managed Azure subscription and cloud consumption. Um, of course, it utilizes like things like HDX technology, which is what you know our, our, our secret sauce and what makes Citrix so great to deliver those users with that ultimate great user experience that they expect, even as they're accessing virtual apps or desktops. Um, but then we had customers who came to us and said, while this is great, 
we only need that for a specific use case, right? Like that doesn't cover our full on use case. And then they had to essentially prior to what I'm gonna announce, um, they had to have two environments, their Citrix virtual apps and desktop service for Azure or their full DAS environment. And then they had to have their CVAT service uh, environment for all other use cases. And so we heard you loud and clear. And what we did this year is we brought on that quick deploy functionality to the entire CVAT family. So essentially you can have Citrix virtual apps and desktop service and still have that managed desktop functionality if you wanted to for specific uh, use cases. So essentially what we're doing is we're providing you with that level of flexibility. And all of this is to say that you'll hear Citrix start referring to CVAT also as DAS because essentially it does have full DAS capabilities. Um, and it's up to you to decide, do I only want them to manage my management plane? Do I want to utilize my own Azure tenant? Do I want to use Citrix's Azure, uh, managed Azure tenant? So we're really putting the flexibility in your hands and it's not a one for all. You could do different things for different use cases like I talked about. Uh, so Citrix virtual apps and desktop service, uh, like I said, you're able to have on-premises VDAs and connect back to those, which is what you know I showed in the conceptual architecture diagram. You're also able to leverage that full DAS capability um, of you know, bursting to the cloud and having resources in Citrix as managed Azure. And like I mentioned, you are able to utilize your own cloud subscription or use ours. That's completely up to you. Um, of course, you could do things like deploy Linux applications and desktops, uh, web and SaaS applications, et cetera. So really Citrix virtual apps and desktop service covers that whole gamut and provides you the flexibility to, depending on your um, on the different scenarios, to, to pick and choose what you want to utilize. So let's jump into our second demo, which is I'm going to show you what this quick deploy um, looks like, right? So you would log into your Citrix Cloud Console like you usually do, and you would click on your Citrix virtual apps and desktop service tile um, like you, you would if you have a, a CVAT service um, account today. Then under manage, you're gonna see this quick deploy functionality. And here's where you're gonna be able to either add your own Azure subscription if you wanted to go that route or utilize Citrix's managed Azure subscription. So this is where you would go ahead and do that. Then you're able to build your own images and you can custom create these images, import your own already existing images. And we also have already templates for you that you can utilize as a baseline. So here you could select a master image, pick what operating system it's gonna be running on, pick the type of storage that you want, the type of workload, as well as the number of machines that you want before you go ahead and create the catalog. What's really cool about this quick deploy um, tab is that you could fully deploy a desktop uh, add subscribers to that desktop. You're gonna see that happening right now uh, without ever going to Web Studio. But you also have the option of going to Web Studio and managing your catalogs if you're already used to utilizing Studio from a workflow perspective. So what you could simply do is deploy the, the desktop and then going to Studio and continue your workflow. Um, within Quick Deploy, you're also able to do power management settings. And this is essentially auto scale. I'm not going to get too deep into that right now because I have a full section on auto scale and how auto scale fits into this whole conceptual architecture diagram. But you are able to do that. And like I mentioned, even if you create um, your desktops utilizing Quick Deploy for those uh, managed desktops, you could still go into Web Studio and get access to things like your policies, your hosting, et cetera. So you will still have access to full Web Studio. Um, if you prefer, or if there's things that you need to do within Web Studio. All right, so now we're gonna talk about service continuity. So service continuity is one of those things which we also released this year um, to close a gap, right? So there was a couple of customers who didn't wanna move to cloud because when you move to cloud, essentially, in a way you're giving up control, right? Like now Citrix is managing a lot of those services. And so what happens if one of those services or if something goes wrong with the cloud? And so with Citrix um, service continuity, although we have a very high SLA of 99.9% .9 uptime, um, we understand that there's customers who are putting really business critical applications on Citrix. And so we're always looking at ways of how we can enhance that resiliency for our customers in order to improve the uptime um, and make sure that even when outages occur, um, because outages do occur, right, in, in any cloud, um, what that happens from an end user perspective. 
So this is what it would look like without service continuity, right? Like if there was any sort of outage, the user would log into their workspace and then they would have no access to apps or when they launch the app, they would get an error. And obviously what that results is, is very frustrated users and help desk tickets completely going on the rise and, and people not being happy. With service continuity, what this looks like is essentially we're still giving user access to certain or all applications. And you were also able to provide a message letting them know like, hey, there's an outage going on, like we're working on it. And so what the, the reason why we chose to do that is because that obviously reduces help desk ticket. Because if as an end user, I know, hey, something is happening with the environment. They're already aware of it and they're working on it. I probably don't need to call a help desk because I'm just going to waste you know, my time, right? And so service continuity essentially is a set of features that help make this happen. So things like uh, workspace connection leases, which I'll talk about in the next slide, uh, progressive web app for workspace app UI, as well as service resiliency through um, redu redundant multi-node deployments are what makes this possible. Alrighty, so let's look at architecturally what this looks like and what happens, right? So in a typical deployment, here you could see a Citrix Cloud site with a customer managed zone at the bottom. And the user would launch their workspace app, and then that workspace app would connect to, um, would generate a single use ICA file that would, um, you know, let the user launch their applications. But what happens if, you know, workspace service or CVAT service are down or if there's an issue connecting to those services? The user essentially wouldn't be able to launch their app if you didn't have service continuity, right? And like I mentioned, we do not want that. So now what happens if we utilize a connection lease file? And the connection lease files are ba basically a long-lived authorization token um, that are cached and they have the end user's entitlement. So it basically lists out the CVAT applications and desktops that the user has access to. And the connectors will utilize the local host cache functionality, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware of that, um, to generate those connection leases, right? And so users will have access to resources that they have never even launched before, as long as they have signed in at least once to their Citrix workspace before the outage. So what happens if, the, if we use connection leases, right? So with service continuity, um, when we're not able to use an ICA file, a connection lease is it's downloaded when the user signs in. And essentially this ticket is what's gonna act as an authorization token. And by default, it's gonna do it for one week period by default. Um, if workspace or see that service are down, um, the session will still be launched using the entitlements that are cached essentially on the user's machine. And this will allow users to see their applications and their desktops. If the user is internal, the connection leads will go direct uh, to the VDA. Um, and so it will connect to the resource location where the application is public and the published, sorry, and the connector essentially will be the one that is making the, re the resolution. So finding the VDA that the user needs to connect to. Um, now, if the user is external, right, right there, um, for that situation, then it will go to the gateway service and it will still require uh, that authentication again, because the connection lease files um, are authorization tokens, but they don't authenticate the user. The only way that um, the user is not required to authenticate is if you have domain pass through configured or if session sharing has been enabled and the user logs in once on that same resource. So those would be the, the two situations um, where they wouldn't be required. Um, here, I'm gonna plug in the click down again. We actually did an episode before service continuity went GA with the product manager, Fernando Kerflin, and we interviewed him and talked everything about how service continuity, why it was built, the different um, backend um, you know, things that, what's happening on the back end. So I really encourage you to, to listen to that episode. It's before we went GA. So we'll definitely have to do another episode with Fernando afterwards, but it's a great episode filled with information. So if you want to uh, learn more, definitely check that episode out. Um, alrighty, so from a demo perspective, we're going to basically see what happens from an end user experience perspective with and without service continuity. So on the left-hand side, we'll have a user without service continuity. And on the right-hand side, we're gonna have a user that has service continuity turned on. 
So on the left-hand side, when the user launches an application, they're going to get an error that the resource is not available. And on the right-hand side, the, the resource is still going to launch, but it's going to require that user to re-authenticate. And so the user will re-authenticate and will be able to just start working. So again, um, your users can still be productive while the outage um, is getting resolved. So now we're going to talk about um, some additional tools and functionality that you can utilize in order to create uh, this DAS for business continuity environment and to make your lives easier in order to do that. So first, I'm going to talk about the automated configuration tool, which is a tool, again, that G8 this year. Um, this tool is meant to help with migration from on-premises sites to the cloud. So again, I know when I was in the field and I was talking daily with customers, a lot of times customers just didn't have the time um, or they didn't want to put in the effort to rebuild you know, a whole new environment from scratch when they already had configuration policies and stuff that worked on-prem. And that's essentially why we created the automation, the automated configuration tool, excuse me, uh, and that it's designed to help automate the migration from on-premises sites to, to cloud or even between CVAC service um, sites as well. Um, so some of the studio configurations that are supported are things like application settings, application groups, icons, machine catalogs, delivery groups, Citrix policies, tags, and host connections. I think I got all of them or most of them. Um, and you're able to provide full customizations uh, for all the actions. So export, import, merge, backup, restore, sync, et cetera. And essentially what we're doing is we're utilizing the Citrix PowerShell SDK. So you can run it from any domain joined machine. Um, so it's a very powerful tool. If you haven't heard of it, I really encourage you to, you know, to learn more. And we also did an episode of the click down also before it went GA, uh, but it has some great information as well as how it works, some of the prerequisites that are required on your side and how you can get access to it. So now we're gonna talk about Autoscale. Um, Autoscale is a great power management tool that we've had for a while now that helps with power management and reduces um, essentially your cloud costs for running uh, machines in the cloud that aren't being utilized. Um, what I have noticed is a lot of people don't know about this burst mode functionality that Autoscale has, where essentially it prioritizes on-premises resources first before bursting to the cloud. So this is exactly what I was talking about in the architectural diagram. Most customers, if they have um, on-premises resources and capacity, they want to utilize that first before, you know, bursting to the cloud and paying for cloud VDIs. And so with Autoscale, you're able to do that. So let's talk a little bit about what that would look like, right, from an auto scale perspective. Um, so essentially, this is you know, just an example for you to understand how, how it works, but you would have two machine catalogs. The first machine catalog would exclusively have your on-premises resources, and the second machine catalog would have your cloud resources. You would create a tag, and that tag would only be applied to catalog two, which is the catalog that has your cloud resources. Then let's talk about zones. And within your zones, you would have also two zones. So zone one would contain catalog one. So this would be your on-premises zone. And zone two would contain catalog two. So this would be your cloud zone. Um, essentially, when you configure this, you would set zone one um, as your preferred zone. Then when we talk about the delivery group, you would have one delivery group, and this delivery group would, would contain machines from both catalogs. So it would contain uh, machines from catalog one, which is your on-premises catalog, and catalog two, which is your cloud catalog. Um, and then essentially your on-premises resources are going to be powered on manually, and they will remain online. And then we'll use auto scale to only power manage the machines that are tagged. So this would be the machines that are tagged cloud. Um, and I'm going to show you what that actually looks like in a demo. Um, again, I know I've been plugging the click down for three slides in a row. I promise I'll, I'll stop. But we also did a great episode. I believe it was actually the last episode that came out two weeks ago of the click down. And we interviewed Nitin Mekta, who's a PM for Autoscale. And we also interviewed Kevin Ardone, who's a director of customer success. Um, and they talk not only about this cloud burst functionality, but everything that you can do from auto scale and some of the great um, 
cost savings that you can achieve by utilizing auto scale. So if you don't have auto scale turned on in your environment, I highly recommend that you take a look at just some of the ways that you can utilize it in order to um, save some costs. Alrighty, so now let's look at the auto scale demo and what that looks like. So I'll show you basically everything that I talked about in the previous slide, I'll actually show you in a demo. Um, so here we have multiple machine catalogs, right? One of them is a cloud machine catalog. So all the resources are hosted in the cloud. And this is a catalog that I would apply that tag to. Um, then if we go into the delivery group, this delivery group is going to have those different catalogs. So it's going to have my on-prem catalog and my cloud catalog within that specific delivery group. Um, if I go into the zones, like I said, you're going to have two different zones. Obviously, you could have more. This is just for simplicity's sake. But you're going to have your on-prem zone as your preferred zone um, so that those resources are launched first before going to zone two. Then if we go back into the delivery group, this is where you enable um, auto scale and um, where you have it so that you only use it to restrict it to the, the machines that have that tag tied to it. One thing I think I forgot to mention is this is a per delivery group setting, so it's not your entire site. Um, so you can manage this per delivery group. If you have certain delivery groups that you do want to burst to the cloud, you would set it up there. And certain delivery groups where you may not have that, you may not need to, then obviously you wouldn't utilize auto scale in that way. Alrighty, so now we're going to talk about image portability. Uh, image portability is a feature that's currently in tech preview. Um, and you're gonna hear a lot more about it in the coming weeks from Citrix. So I'll just give you a little bit of a preview if you haven't heard about what image portability does. Essentially image portability is, it simplifies image management and it allows you to move those images very easily from on-prem to cloud um, across different cloud regions or across different public clouds. So let's say you have a multi-cloud approach where you're utilizing Azure and something like GCP. This is where image portability would come in to help make that moving of your image very, very easily. So essentially how it works is um, you're gonna have your on you're gonna export your on-prem image from your on-prem hypervisor and prep them for upload. And this will include things like converting the file system type um, to common formats for the cloud. Then you're gonna upload that image uh, to the the target customer cloud subscription. And essentially what this is, is this is a point-to-point -point transfer um, utilizing the config and credentials that are supplied uh, by you, the administrator, um, to get access to that cloud subscription. Then we're gonna migrate that image into the public cloud. And essentially what, what's happening in the background is there's a bunch of steps. So we're removing source platform compon components we're injecting target platform components and we're reconfiguring and rearming that BDA uh, based on the supplied configuration properties. And essentially what happens at the end of the migration process is that we're gonna boot that image, um, let the plug and play run, configure the operating system for that new platform. And once all of that is done, um, then you'll have your image ready to be used and provisioned with, um, with MCS. Um, essentially throughout the process, I know when I first heard of it, I was like, wait, this sounds very familiar. Um, so if you've heard of app layering, essentially is what we're leveraging in the background is that app layering technology in order to provide this for you and make it in a very uh, easy way for you to, to convert those images and move them from on-prem to the cloud. Alrighty, now we are going to jump into networking. So like I mentioned before, right, it's great that we have this burst to cloud functionality, uh, but there's a lot of applications that have app data that they need to, you know, reach that live on premises or your end users for them to really have that transparent experience like I showed at the beginning. They need to have access to file servers that they do um, on prem and have that functionality, right? So when you're talking about um, see that service and the quick deploy, when you set it up, you actually have three network options. You can have it so that it has no network connectivity, and this essentially means that it can't connect back to your on-premises resources. You can utilize Azure VNet peering to connect from the cloud to on-prem, or you could utilize SD-WAN like I showed in our conceptual diagram. 
the good thing about SD-WAN is that it has so many functionalities outside of this that you could utilize it for, and it works perfectly within our HDX technology and stack. Um, it also provides uh, QoS and, re and reliability for ICA. And essentially what happens is that SD-1 appliances are created in Citrix Managed Azure. And for all, in for all intents and purposes, from an SD-WAN perspective, that location is essentially treated as a branch. Um, beforehand, so before you start your quick deploy as a prereq, you do need to have um, and configure your SD-WAN deployment. Um, so what that means is that you need to have your master control node, and that could be either in the cloud or on-premises, and it does need to be managed by SD-WAN orchestrator, like I showed in the conceptual um, architecture diagram. Um, Alrighty, so last but not least, we're going to talk about one of my favorite Citrix products, which is analytics. And analytics, we're going to talk both about Citrix analytics for performance and Citrix analytics for security. And we are going to have demos on both of them. Um, so Citrix Analytics for Performance fits in very nicely to this whole architecture because it provides administrators a proactive view of your users and what experience they're having. And so this allows you to proactively fix issues before they actually become issues and you have users calling in the help desk. You can obviously also use it from a reactive troubleshoot perspective to like nail down um, through its search functionality of what's going on if a specific user calls with an issue. So you could use it for both proactive and reactive troubleshooting. Um, the other really cool thing that I think is very popular amongst our customers is this multi-site aggregation and reporting. So I know when I was in the field, this was before uh, analytics uh, had come out, a lot of my customers were like, Anna, we have multiple sites. We just want to be able to see holistically across our environment and not have to log into different director consoles. And so analytics for performance allows you to do that. So you have this ability across all of your sites, whether these are on-prem sites or cloud sites, and you could look at your environment holistically or filter out per specific site, which is really, really awesome. So let's look at exactly what this looks like. So you can see that your users are divided into different uh, user experience categories. So poor user experience, fair or excellent. And you can filter out by different time periods. Um, you can also click on a specific category. So let's say our poor user experience. And you'll notice that the user experience is basically calculated based on four factors. Session availability, session responsiveness, session log on duration, and session resiliency. And each of them have associated sub factors that you can drill down into to see really what is happening within those users. Um, if we look at the session log on duration, we also even go as far as provide insights to you to tell you exactly why a user might be experiencing um, you know, a poor experience and giving you tips on how to troubleshoot again proactively to make sure that your users have the best experience possible especially if they're working remotely, right? We want to be able for them to be super productive. Um, the other thing that uh, Citrix Analytics for Performance provides is machine insights. So really insights into your machines and what's going on within your machines. So it could help you identify very easily overloaded machines. So machines that have high CPU and memory that may be causing failures or black hole machines, which black hole machines are essentially machines that are causing failures without having high CPU or high memory. So something else might be going on within those machines. Um, also, we have advanced search functionality within uh, these machines. So let's take a look at exactly what this looks like. So here we could see, um, we could you know, do different search queries within the machine. We could also filter out with, um, you know, or sort through different categories. So here I'm actually gonna go in and sort through machines that have high session failure. This top one has a 30% failure rate, which in my opinion is very high because it means that 37% of the requests that are hitting these, this specific machine are failing, which is obviously not a good thing. But if you notice, you will notice that the average CPU, the peak CPU, the average memory and the peak uh, memory are not very high. So it's, you know, it's probably not being caused by this machine being overloaded. Um, just like with the users, I can click on that specific machine and get more details. And so when I click on that machine, I'm able to see that correlation across time um, to see if you know there was a peak in CPU or a peak in memory that maybe was causing those session failures. 
um, and, and be able to correlate it that way. And I can go back in time and search, um, you know, to see what might be happening with this specific machine. One of the things that we've recently added, which I don't have in this demo, is now we're able to, um, to do machine actions right within the Citrix Analytics console. And what that means is if I want to do further troubleshooting, if I want to put this machine in maintenance mode or restart the machine, shut down the machine, uh, before then you would have to go and do that in studio. Um, now you could do it straight from Citrix Analytics and, and do these actions if you have full administrator access um, to perform these machines without ever having to leave the analytics console, which I think is also a uh, very uh, powerful functionality. Alrighty, so Citrix Analytics for security. Citrix Analytics for security, um, essentially what it does is that it's continuously assessing the behavior of your users and making sure that there's no malicious users, compromised users, stolen credentials. And then we're able to have associated actions so that if you know Citrix Analytics finds something suspicious, then we can take an action to prevent you know, any security breaches from happening in your environment. So the best way that I like to explain it is like the credit card companies where the credit card companies know my spend patterns. And if I deviate from that, there'll be an associated action, whether that's um, a text verifying that, hey, is this really you? So we can actually send the user an email verifying, hey, is this you doing this? Um, or things like starting session recording, quarantining the user, alerting the administrator that something might be going on for them to take a look. Um, so this is my last demo of the day. So here we're gonna look at what the Citrix Analytics for Security dashboard looks like and some of the things that you can do. So some of the things that you can do is you could see your top risk, risky users. You can see things like your access summary report. You could see your top policies and actions that are being applied by Citrix Analytics for security. And then the other thing that you can do is you can also go and look at a specific user and see their risk timeline, which means that you could see exactly what actions the user is taking that you know, analytics is deeming as risky, where, those, um, where analytics is getting that from, and if analytics um, did any actions in order to prevent that. Um, also, one of the things that is very popular within Citrix Analytics for security is the Access Assurance Dashboard. So this is for this specific user, but you also have that holistically for the entire environment where you could see where users are accessing from. And we actually had one customer that told us that they only had a US presence. And when they implemented uh, Citrix um, Analytics, they saw that there was a couple of users that were accessing from the Middle East and they realized that those were actually compromised users and they probably would have never found that out if it hadn't been for Citrix Analytics. So that's you know, how powerful Citrix Analytics can be. Alrighty, so that was a lot of information. Um, I think it's been like 45 minutes of me talking. <laughs> so we're gonna do a quick wrap up. I'm gonna share some additional resources and then we're gonna open it up for, for Q&A. So from a wrap-up perspective, I kind of wanted to bring it full circle now that you heard me talk about all the components that you know make up this DAS for business continuity architecture. And so we talked about Citrix Workspace, which provides a unified user experience for the end user, end user no matter what device or endpoint they're accessing from. We talked about uh, Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktop Service and how now that's able to provide not only access to on-premises resources, but you're also able to burst and use that Citrix Managed Azure or the functionality that we used to have with those managed desktops. Um, we talked about things like the automated configuration tool and image portability to help facilitate um, your migration and, and moving those images. And we also talked about auto scale, which essentially that's what helps the burst functionality where it prioritizes on-prem resources before bursting um, to the cloud. And then we talked about SD-WAN. Of course, SD-WAN is an integral part of the solution as it provides access from your cloud environment back to your on-premises resources. And then last but not least, we walked through analytics and how that really provides you with the insights that you need, both from a performance and security perspective to make sure that your users have the best experience possible, as well as that your environment remains secure and that there's no breaches um, or that your intellectual property is um, in danger of being leaked. Alrighty, so from additional resources perspective, uh, I believe this will be the last time I mentioned the click down, I promise. 
So we do have episodes on the click down on a lot of these topics. So the automated configuration tool, service continuity, performance analytics, DAS, and auto scale. And in most of these episodes, um, we have um, the product managers that are responsible for these products. So they definitely know the product inside out and they're uh, great. You know, they're usually 20 to 30 minutes. So if you're on the run or driving, it's a it's a great time to listen to. And again, make sure that you um, subscribe. We have episodes every other week and we have some really awesome episodes that are coming out in the in the next couple of weeks. Um, then we also talked about TechZone Live. So TechZone Live, uh, we're in the process of planning Q4. The registration link is not live yet, but it will be um, available in that QR code that I um, that I have on this slide. And then as well as we have all the Q1 through three sessions on demand. And these are just some of the sessions that we talked in the previous quarter that relate to this topic. Each of those sessions is also about 20 minutes. So if you want to go and take a look, they usually have uh, really good demos and it's either a consultant, an SCU product manager. So they're they're very technical in nature. Be sure to check it out and stay on the lookout for the Q4 registration of that. Um, TechZone, like I mentioned in TechZone, we have some really awesome resources. Um, we recently started creating reference architectures that not only focus on a specific product. So we do have reference architectures, let's say that are just everything on CVET service. Uh, but recently we've gotten requests to do reference architectures that focus on a use case. So for example, a DAS for business continuity, and that talk about all the different products that you need in order to make that environment um, work. And so I actually authored the DAS for business continuity reference architecture, which is why I'm here today to talk to you. Um, so be sure to check that out. And then coming soon, I'm gonna have a DAS for business continuity video come out. And essentially these videos are usually two to three minutes in length, so very short. And we explain very quickly what the use case is and how Citrix fits in. So these are great if you wanna share with like upper management, if you're thinking about a new use case um, and how Citrix fits in. And they may not have the time to sit in through like a 45 minute, a one hour recording like you guys did today. These are great videos to share. And like I said, the DAS for business continuity video will be uh, coming out very shortly. And then last but not least from a, a per announcement perspective, if you haven't heard of our Launchpad events, um, these are events that are gonna be happening in September and beginning of October uh, once a week. Um, they're 20 to 30 minute sessions and they will be streamed on LinkedIn Live. And these will be members of our ELT that are be, they're gonna be giving announcements of either things that were recently released with Citrix, things that are coming and how they fit in into our overall uh, vision and strategy. So I highly recommend that you register for those. And then we're gonna have a lot of resources that you could take a look at afterwards that are related to the announcements that will be made um, during these events. So make sure to, um, to check that out. And with that, that was a lot of me talking. <laughs> so I will turn it over to Bart. Let me stop sharing my screen um, so that we can open it up for Q&A. Yeah, there's a few of them. First question is, why would I want to burst through cloud if all my backend applications and resources are on-premise? That's a great question. Okay. Uh oh, I think we lost her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> maybe she'll come back in. Um, I don't know what happened. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer that. Um, it basically comes down to networking. If your application is um, can handle the, network, the enhanced network latency between the cloud and on-prem, then you'll be fine. Otherwise, you have to look at the application to move to the cloud and have it hosted in the cloud all the time or all the time on-prem. That's basically the short answer. Sorry, I meant to close out of the PowerPoint and I closed out of the webinar. So that was <laughs> my apology. Well, I'm welcome back. back. <laughs> I was like, no, I, I, I quit the wrong thing. Because I wanted yeah. to see Bart's face. Alrighty, sorry, Bart. No problem, I, I, I do the question. Um, I don't know which question was, um, which cloud services is Citrix currently supporting if I want to use my own? So for the DAS functionality that I talked about, which is a quick deploy right now, we're only on Azure, but we do um, have a multi-cloud strategy. So like we have customers that, you know, are across different clouds. Uh, we just don't have that quick deploy functionality. 
So you could go on GCP on, um, on Amazon as well, if you wanted to. Okay, and yeah, the question is evolving comments in coming. Why Citrix over AVD? Uh, so that is a great question, and I will do a, a plug of another video that's coming out that I'm actually a part of where we spend 20 minutes answering that specific question, but I'll do a really quick summary of, um, of, of what we talk about. So one um, is hybrid multi-cloud, right, which I just talked about two seconds ago. So with AVD, you can only utilize Azure. You can't go on-prem, you can't use multiple clouds. With Citrix, we have the ability of having that hybrid deployment with most of our customers are in that bucket. Um, some of the other reasons why you would utilize Citrix over ABD is things like HDX. Um, so these, you know, with HDX, we improve the user experience. We have things like browser redirection in order to ensure that the end user experience is key. Um, and things like auto scale and analytics, which I talked about, are also some of the, you know, other reasons that I would, that I recommend utilizing Citrix over ABD. But like I did mention, be on the lookout. We have a 20 minute video that talks that answers this question. So um, that should be coming out shortly too. Okay, perfect. Um, one other question is, do you need to enable both security and performance analytics or can you only enable one of them? So you don't need to enable both. You can only enable one or the other or neither, right? Like I said, uh, analytics is optional. It's not required. So you can enable one or the other. I recommend you enable both because they both have great functionalities, but you don't need both in order for it to work. Okay, that's it, I think. Awesome. Okay, you guys got through the questions really fast. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're right on time too, so. Yeah, I just have one last little slide um, and it's really just a thank you slide if I can make it come over there. Um, and every time I do this, it wants to show the blank window. I don't know why. Um, yeah, it doesn't. It's not showing up. Sometimes go to webinars a little a little clunky, uh, <laughs> but um, in lieu of that, I just want to thank you all for for being here today. Thank you, Anna. It was great to have you on our webinar stage, and thank you, Bart, for keeping an eye on those questions. Appreciate you being here today. And finally, if um, some of you may remember um, there is an Apple Air tag we're giving away and if you are like me sometimes you just can't find your stuff um, so <laughs> or if you have kids who like to hide them or in my case I have a puppy a new puppy that likes to carry things around um, so I'm going to do a random drawing after the webinar is done I'll pull the report and we'll put you all in the Google randomizer and pull out a name and be on the lookout for an email from me to let you know if you won or a tweet from me to just just let everyone know who won. All right. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. I did put a link in the chat for you to the survey. Like I said, it's super short and anonymous and uh, love to get your feedback. And thanks again, Anna and Bart. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks everyone for joining. Nice to, to see you guys. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye everyone. Have a great day. We'll see you at the next event soon. Bye.